Would anyone like to make a guess at what might have been the single most destructive agreement made since 1900? What was the single most destructive agreement or decision made since 1900? Anyone want to take a swing at that? I think what is in the running for the single, the day of most stupidity was when the Treaty of Versailles was signed at the end of the First World War. It was an agreement in which Germany was a force to accept all responsibility for all guilt, all damage, all loss of life, all the problems of the war, Germany was forced to assume uh, the guilt for. It's kind of a vindictive treaty. And the vindictiveness was not just a formal uh, uh, guilt issue, but also uh, Germany was stripped of all resources. They were forced to pay reparations. Uh, they were stripped of land and had to send all, all of their goods to other nations before they could begin rebuilding their own. Right? They were devastated as well as everyone else, but their, own, their lumber, their coal, everything they had was, was taken. Uh, and when France was not satisfied that it was getting as much as Germany could give. Uh, France actually went in and occupied the industrial core of Germany so that they could extract more. Some folk at the time saw how bad this would be, that this was not a peace treaty but more of a pause, uh, because it led to Germany imploding. Germany, the economy just collapsed. Right? People would have to get wheelbarrows to move enough uh, money to get to the store to buy a loaf of bread. And can you imagine that? You would get th use this much money to buy that much bread. Um, and so the economy collapsed. They had hyperinflation. Blame became the order of the day as people looked at groups whom to blame for what was happening. Their politics turned, the German politics turned toxic and it led to the rise of the Nazi party. A and within 20 years, the implosion of Germany sucked the rest of the continent back into war. And so 20 years after the Treaty of Versailles, World War II began. And, and you could make the argument that World War II really isn't a second world war. It's World War I that continued 20 years later because Versailles was so self-centered, greedy, vindictive, stupid, right? Against that, one of the best moments in, in the last century came in 1948 at the end of World War II. As Europe struggled to rebuild, as the economies of the world stuttered and stumbled, the Marshall Plan began. Y'all hear the Marshall Plan? I just go to, it's sort of understood that this is, um, the Marshall Plan is named after the person who proposed it at an address at Harvard, General George Marshall. The plan began, the plan was different from Versailles in pretty much every way. Versailles was imposed. The Marshall Plan began with America gathering all involved parties at a round table in Paris. Everyone was invited, right? including the USR and USSR and Germany. The USSR did not that walked away and wouldn't take part of it, but, but Germany came, right? The country that had lost was welcome at the table to decide how to rebuild. And America made offers of itself. America offered uh, funding, it ended up being about $120 billion in today's money, is how much they, they offered. Right? They, they offered that as grants, as loans, as aid, technical assistance, expertise, people that went over and helped figure out how to rebuild what was happening. And these were mutually uh, put together, mutually agreeable uh, 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 treaties and agreements that rebuilt Europe based on the understanding that a strong Europe required a strong Germany. And so this happened in a day and in an age when it wasn't exactly like America was in great shape either. I, after, in Sunday school, after, in Green City, I, it was interesting to talk about, for folks to talk about that, because Benita Couch and Jean Heeman can remember, like, Jean didn't know if she was going to ever get enough bananas. Because she remembers in those days after World War II, in the late 40s and early 50s, not having enough fruit. Right? And Benita talks about having the books, and some of you remember as well the stamp books, where you'd have to go and you got as much as you could get, and that was that. Right? And so, and, and people were farming in the fields of America with jeeps because there weren't any tractors and wearing their uniforms from the war because that's the only clothing they had. So it wasn't like America was in this place of amazing prosperity. 
And yet, that America decided to give, and give sacrificially. And what's fascinating, y'all know Rolf Christen? He was at church today this morning as well. And it's the Marshall Plan that fed him. Right? The Marshall Plan, it was fascinating to hear this, because Rolf could talk about his mama would get a box, this big old crate, and it would be full of lard. And the neighbor would get another box and be full of vegetable oil. And the neighbor would get another box and be full of flour, and everyone would just go and trade. And uh, so they, America sent the staple so that people, and, and that was the beginning, and then it led to the, the, the redevelopment of, of Europe. But this time in which the world was fractured, it was rebuilt based upon America taking the first step to self-sacrificially give and form these agreements with other nations, including the nations that had lost. This, uh, this, this Marshall Plan, this approach, the antithesis of Versailles, was essential to establishing the stable, peaceable world order that we, uh, we enjoy to this day. Right? It was not a given that after World War II that we were done with world wars. If you think about it, Europe was weak. USSR, the USSR was rising in the east. And if Europe had stayed in a bad shape, what would, have, what would that have looked like? What would the 40s, 50s, and 60s looked like if Europe had not been rebuilt? Right? What did it take to hold the line against the USSR? It took a strong Europe and a partnership with a strong America, or else we very well could have had World War III in the 60s and 70s. The world we enjoy today was not possible without the Marshall Plan, right? in ways that we don't even we lose track of. Like the Marshall Plan is what helped spin up what was called at the time the European Steel and Coal Community. You don't know the European Steel and Coal Community by that name today. The European Steel and Coal Community has a different name. It's called the European Union. Right? That comes out of the Marshall Plan. The peace, the stability we know today came because George Marshall chose to walk away from a Versailles-style response at the end of the war and to sacrifice and to lead to something greater and better and to build peace. It's amazing. One of the best moments, finest moments in American history right there. There are three approaches to Advent that you can take. There are three approaches where we're beginning this season of Advent, this time when we, we look towards Christ who is to come. The first approach to Advent you can take is you focus on how Christ came in the past, and that's uh, Joseph and Mary and Elizabeth and, and, and the stable and all of that. that that's focusing on Christ to, who, who came once, and that's what we usually hear most of, right? Christ has come. Another way to focus ourselves in Advent is to look at the way that Christ comes into our lives today. And, and then a third way to focus ourselves in Advent is to say, what does it mean that Christ will come again? Right? And it's that third one that we're going to be focusing on this, this particular season of Advent. It's the one that we hear the least about, but it is the one our faith depends upon. We can't, it's not enough to say Christ has come. Sweet. Right? Christ is coming in our lives today. Wonderful. Christ will come again. That is our faith. That, that's when God's will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That, that's heaven. That, that's the kingdom of God. And that is our, our faith needs that, right? And so we'll be exploring this, this third approach to Advent with help from the prophet Isaiah this, this coming month. Now, Isaiah preached in a time uh, of Judah in the 8th century B.C. And Judah in the 8th century B.C. was not quite, this, not quite as bad as 1940s Europe, but still had some problems. Right? There, the prophet was speaking to a situation in which Judah, the southern, the 12 tribes of Israel, the north 10 was Israel, the southern two tribes were Judah. And Judah was stuck in this place between the fading but still momentous power of Egypt, the empire of Egypt to the southwest, and to the northeast was the rising power of Assyria, the rising empire of Assyria, exerting control for the first time in the region. And so it's a tense time politically, and the people of Judah have to decide what are they going to depend upon? What are they going to trust? Right? What are they going to trust in these hard, interesting days to come? And the prophet Isaiah points out that they were trusting in the soothsayers from the Philistines from the east. They were trusting in their money, right? They have lots of money. There's lots of gold and lots of riches. And whenever Israel or Judah gets plenty of money, whenever they're full, they, they start to lose track of 
who helped them be full in the first place. And so there's a problem there. And they had their chariots. It says uh, they had horses and chariots. And, and when we think of chariots, like when we see someone driving a horse and, and pulling something, we think of like the Amish, right? Little black, kind of lightweight thing. That's not a chariot. That's not what we're talking about in the 8th century BC. We're, taught, we're thinking about an ancient tank where you put the biggest horses you can find, pulling the biggest wooden enclosure you can find, so big that it can just plow into infantry and grind them underneath, and then you load up this, the wooden enclosure with archers. So you basically have an, an ancient tank, right? And so the prophet Isaiah is pointing out that you are trusting in your soothsayers, they're telling you what you want to hear. You're trusting in your money, and you're trusting in your military that this is going to be what's going to get you through. Right. The prophet starts condemning idols, the, the, and these are the idols that they're, they're worshiping. An idol being what you trust most when what you trust most is anything other than God. And, and the prophet Isaiah reminds the people that God is going to be exalted. Right? God is going to be taller than any tree, greater than any sailing ship or the highest fortress or the mightiest mountains. And that in the days to come, you are going to realize this. You are going to know this. You are going to experience this. And that's where the prophet, the language, you have to unpack a part of the language. When a prophet says, in those days, he's not talking about next Thursday. When a prophet says, in those days, he's talking about uh, the end times. He's talking about the times to come. He's talking about down the road when Christ will come in final victory. Right? That's how prophets speak about the future. That's the refrain they use to clue you in that they're talking about the, the, the proverbial it. In those days. Right? In those days, the prophet tells us, uh, he uses the imagery of heat. In those days, those who follow God are going to be smelted like silver. Right? Smelting is a process of taking silver ore with all the junk that it comes in and purifying it. To smelt silver is to burn away everything that is not silver. So, and it's only after smelting that it is pure and beautiful and precious. And so the imagery here is that those who follow God are going to be smelted of all of the idolatry and all of the sin, and those who follow God are going to be made pure and beautiful and precious. And then the prophet continues, and that's where we, about this use of heat, and talks about how swords are going to be beat into plowshares, and spears into pruning hooks, and nations will not rise against nations ever again. Right? This idea that heat is applied, it's heat applied to the people who follow God, and so people are going to become the tools of peace. People will be transformed so that the people who follow God will be as beautiful as silver and as useful for peace as a plow is. Right? Now, take a minute to appreciate what type of work goes into this. It takes, what does it take to get something to 1,763 degrees? Yeah, how hot does your oven get? It, has, it says it goes up to 500. I'm not sure that I believe it. Right? Carl, what does it take to get up to 1,763 degrees? Yeah, it takes some doing, right? It's not easy. I don't know the answer either. I, I wish I did. But, you know, that takes some work. It, you ever see someone actually blacksmith? You ever see someone take a piece of iron or steel and work it? It's hard. Right? You have got to beat on that thing. Again, it, it makes me tired just watching someone. It, it's one of those days when, when I, I've seen people blacksmith, and, and I look at my very soft hands, and I look at what they're doing, and I am just very, very impressed. When, what God is talking about here through the prophet Isaiah is not a transformation of people by just sort of done. Right? This is a transformation that takes effort and work and time and heat. But the result is as beautiful as silver and as practical as a plow. It is this type of work that builds and makes people into the tools of peace, such that we can say with the prophet Isaiah that the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of all of the mountains, right? Mountains being nations, so everyone will come to the nation of God, and God will judge between the nations, and people will be hammered, their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. This is the, the, the promise of where we're heading. When Christ comes again, peace is going to win. That's what we are made for. That's what we are built for. God built us to become tools of peace. 
That, that is where we are headed, right? We can't smelt ourselves, we can't beat ourselves from swords into to plows, but as we submit ourselves to God, that is what, where we're headed. And we get glimpses of how powerful this can be when we see people make decisions, like instead of deciding to do another Versailles, you choose to do the Marshall Plan. Instead of being vindictive and self-centered, you choose to self-sacrifice. Right? and work for the good of others. It was a tool of peace, and it had amazing results. Right? It may be that we will always struggle with war until kingdom come, but in these times when there is a threat of wars and rumors of war, we can be the tools of peace, showing the glimpses of Christ that is coming. That's the focus of Advent, right? When we say Christ is coming again, we are saying that peace is coming, and we are becoming the tools of that peace. And that becomes a very practical thing because we have to live practical lives, right? To talk about the Marshall Plan, that gets kind of big and vaster than we can get our mind around. And the most important person that, we're, that, that actually facilitates Advent is Mary, right? And Mary, is, she is as common as they come, right? Mary is so important she gets her own color, but the color that she gets is blue. And it is the color of the common. It's the color of the day-to-day, -day, right? All the colors that we put on the altar have a meaning. The green is for growth, the, the red is for the Holy Spirit, the white is the exaltation of the resurrection, the purple is for the king, but the blue is for the commonness of Mary. And what is the most common blue cloth? Jeans. Right? I actually had someone make this for me. Blue jean. Right? She looked at me like I was crazy and I told her what I wanted. But blue jeans, right? It is the most common cloth because that is how we, we live our lives following Jesus. It is in the day in day, day in and day out common decisions. Right? Our lives can feel rather mundane, but they're mundane much like Mary's life was mundane. Mundane in the same way in which Mary, what made her so amazing is that she accepted that her life was going to be shaped for use as a tool of peace by God. Right? Long before he was general of the army, George Marshall, he was uh, the grandson of a pastor in Pennsylvania who loved to play in the crick and really was not a good student. George Marshall, not a good student. But he loved his mama, he played in the crick, and he loved to wear blue jeans. I mean, that's just kind of, he was just a guy, just a teenage guy living normal life. And it is a common living, the stuff we do while wearing blue jeans, that is where we lean into the kingdom that is to come. That's when we are doing the hard work of submitting ourselves to being smelted, purified. We are submitting ourselves to being slowly transformed from swords into plows, becoming the tools of peace day by day, right? That peace that comes from knowing that we are forgiven and then sacrificing as we forgive others. That, in that way of sacrificing, it forgives others, it forgives our families, it forgives our communities, it changes how we live. There will be moments in our lives when we might have to make such big decisions as Versailles versus Marshall. Right? Then we have to decide whether we will be self-centered or self-sacrificial. And you ever, if you ever find yourself in the, the place where you're having to decide between international trees, PD approaches, please look at the Marshall Plan. Good idea. It is far more likely that we are going to spend most of our lives like Mary. Right? We're going to spend most of our lives, like Mary, making these decisions day in and day out, and they, we have the same decision. Right? Will we be self-centered in how we act, or will, be, or will we be self-sacrificial? Will we be tools for ourselves, or will we be tools of peace? I hope that we can be tools of peace. I hope that if we live our day-to-day -day lives, we can be pointing towards and leaning into the coming of Christ again, such that when we, people hear of Jesus, they can say, yes, I, I see that. I see that that peace is possible, and I want to be part of it as well. Amen. Please stand with me and join.